Good day, everyone. Uh, we're going to get a quick introduction to Python. All right, so I'm going to be looking at Notebook 2. And so if you want to go ahead and get that one fired up, so let's do that. Let's go into the start here and then the course calendar. And so the thing that I'm working on <clears throat> is going to be Notebook 2. Wait, Notebook 1, Notebook 2. Sorry about that. I did <laughs> look at this before. And so let's take a look at what we're going to be learning. All right. So the first thing is you're going to see an initialization code. So almost every one of our notebooks has an initial code block. Okay. And a lot of it is junk that you don't need to know. Again, we program in anything that's complex or or hard to deal with, we go ahead and put that in. Um, and then one of the things that we do is we create an alias. So NumPy is this package that we use all the time and you know it has numbers in it like Pi. For some reason, you know, the regular um, Python doesn't have Pi or E, so there's a special package that has that. And we import it as an alias with an alias called MP. So NP is the alias. And again, we're just calling this package that has these special numbers. Um, and whenever we're going to use those, then we go ahead and, you know, open up the NumPy package. And it's in that initial code block, and you don't, nest, don't usually need to worry about it, but it's good to know um, what's going on with that. So, so here we are back in Notebook 2, and this is the initial code block, okay? And the top line imports data science. So that's the package that we use. Um, the data science package helps us run all of those applied statistics, data science things that um, are important for the course. And then it imports the NumPy uh, with an alias. And then this part down in the bottom is really about the plots and graphics. And um, if you look carefully, we're using 538. Um, which is a professional um, polling and analysis organization. They do both politics and sports. Uh, so, so we're using, um, so our graphics will have a nice professional look and feel. Okay, so that's just the initial code block. I want to let you know that they do exist. And we can hit either run or shift enter. Shift enter runs the code and then goes to the next cell. Okay. And so Python can do math just like a graphing calculator or a spreadsheet, right? You just type in 2 plus 18, and believe it or not, the answer is 20. And, two minus, and 20 minus 2 is 18, and 2 times 9 is 18, 9 divided by 3. Now notice it gives me a decimal place here, so we'll talk about types of numbers. It turns out that it does this division and thinks that it is a real number even though three is an integer. And we'll talk about that. Um, it does do order of operations correctly, so it'll do the multiplication first. So the nine times three is done first, which is 27, and then the plus two makes it 29. If we want to change the order of operations, of course, we can use parentheses. And now look at this. Okay, so let's jump back. Okay. Um, so. We're noticing that, you know, just like our graphing calculators, Python will do all the basic mathematical tasks, but we're used to seeing exponents handled like this. Um, and a lot of times on a graphing calculator, you now we have a little caret button and it'll be two caret eight. Um, well, we can't use that. Um, that's a different command in Python. So we use a double asterisk. So one asterisk, so two times three is just one asterisk. So two times three equals six. But if I want two raised to the third power, right, I do a double asterisk here. Okay, so so that's a little bit confusing until you get used to it, admittedly. Uh, but let's go with it and jump back in to the notebook and see how this works, okay? So two, Asterisk, asterisk, four, that's two to the four, so that'll be what, 16? Yes. Okay. 
Um, and now hello. So notice we're using string variables and we need to have um, quotation marks around all of our text. Okay, so um, normally we're used to using variables with names like this, but in this class we're going to use descriptive variable names. So for example, if we wanted to create a variable and store the number of vowels in Joe's full name, um, for this class, we might choose something like Joe underscore number underscore vowels equals five. This is what we mean by a descriptive variable name. Instead of saying, you know, Y equals five, which might work in an algebra class, right? We're going to use a more descriptive variable name um, in this class. And that's carried through the textbook, all of the notebooks, labs, homeworks. That's carried through. Um, so you'll get used to that. Um, let me get rid of the ink there. And we have a bunch of regular math functions like max and min and abs for absolute value. Notice, though, that we do need the NumPy package for average, which is weird. It's one of the ones we use a lot in this class. We also have to go into the NumPy package for median. <laughs> um, I don't know. It, you have to spell the whole word out, and I'm sorry, I have trouble writing. Um, with a mouse. But yeah, so MP average, MP median, it turns out that we also need it, uh, like I pointed out earlier, for special numbers like pi and e. We need to do MP pi and MP e, or Python doesn't know what we're talking about. Okay, so let's jump back in and finish this up. Sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, and so 2 raised to the 3 power, so if I tried to do the exponents the wrong way, notice that it doesn't throw an error. But there is no way that 2 to the 3 equals 1, right? 2 to the 3 equals 8. So this caret operator is doing something different than we're used to. Okay, so just remember, if we're going to do, if we're going to do, um, exponents, if we're expecting it to, to interpret it at that 4 as an exponent, use the double asterisk, you will get the wrong answer because it's doing something different with that caret. Okay? Um, and then this is funny. LO times 5. So Python works um, weirdly with text. <laughs> so L O L O L O L, um, and it doesn't always work well with text. Uh, sometimes it will handle it, and it'll come out with something like this. So we don't generally use math or arithmetic on on text, but you know we're throwing that out there just to let you know it is possible. There are some funny things that happen. Okay, so variables again, we can use a equals four. Now notice that this is different when I have a double um, equal sign. Why? Well, because we set a equal to 4 in here. Let me just show you. So we have a equal to 4, and I'll uh, put an a in there so it'll actually print out. So because a is on the last line, it prints out its value. So a is equal to 4. This 4 equal equal a, that's checking to see if the two things on either side of the double equals are equal to each other. Okay, so that's that's checking. This, a single equal sign is an assignment operator. It assigns the value of four to A. The double equal sign checks to see if the two things are in fact equal to each other. Okay, and there's the A. Uh, we can see that it equals four, so I'll get rid of that. B equals nine, okay. A times 3. Well, A is equal to 4, so A times 3 should be 12, right? And A hasn't changed. Just because I multiply it by something doesn't mean it changes value. So in an expression like, like one of these two, um, Python just calculates it. Total A plus B, that's 3 and 4, right? So total equals, oh wait, B equals 9, I'm sorry, A equals 4. So 9 plus 4 does in fact equal 13. So total does equal 13. And then if I say, hey, A equals 10, instead of A equals 4, A equals 10, we should add 6, right? Oh, but this is weird. Total hasn't changed. Oh, because I haven't run this line of text again. 
okay? So if I do the total equals a plus b, then total will get the 6 new, right? Because a is now equal to 10 instead of 4. But the total doesn't change until I actually rerun this line of code again, which is why they have it down here. Okay. And then word equals total, we sometimes have um, variables assigned to strings or text. And yep, that's cool. And total is still equal to 19, even though its name is used. That's why it's important to always put, we either put single quotes or double quotes around text or strings every time we use them. All right. And we're going to get into tables in just a moment. Why are we going to talk about tables? Well, every time we use data, right, every time we're trying to look at variables, we use a table. So we have to learn how to import it. And we always use this command table.readTable. OK. And so every variable is a column, and every column has a name in the top row. OK, so the flavor column tells me the flavor. Obviously, this appears to be ice cream. OK, and then the color column tells me what color. And the price column tells me the price. So every row is a different cone. All right. Um, a, a different ice cream cone or, or ice cream serving. And so, um, and then all the variables that we have, um, you know, flavor, color, price. So a table is where we're going to get, is where we store all of our data. Okay. So. Let's jump back and we talked about this. We're gonna use more descriptive names. Why? Well, because it's just easier. So there's 40 hours in a week and there's 52 weeks in a year. So the, um, let's see what we're doing here, right? So hours per week and hours per year, then hours per year equals hours per week times hours per year. Okay, so how many hours per year are there? There's, there's 2,080 hours per year. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'm sorry about that. Perhaps some of you heard that phone ringing in the background. I did have to answer that. Uh, so back, so if we multiply the hours per year, excuse me, the hours per week times the weeks in a year, then we get the hours per year. And then um, the California minimum uh, hourly wage is $15 an hour. So then weekly wages our hours per week times the California hourly minimum wage. So $600 is the minimum wage for a week if you work 40 hours a week. And then we can figure out what it is per year. So 40,000 um, well, yearly wages is hours per year times California. So it's uh, the minimum wage is about $31,200 per year if you work um, How many we did weeks per year nobody actually works 52 weeks per year we usually do 50 most everybody gets sometime at christmas you know sometime at thanksgiving sometime around the fourth you know there are holidays so so usually a good way to estimate your uh your yearly salary if you're um you know if you're if you're getting paid by the hour is to estimate about 2000 hours per year that's 40 hours per week for 50 weeks and again that just assumes that a couple weeks of the year you're taking some time off but if you did work 52 hours it would be 31,200 um, and notice that if I multiply if I put in a, a well let me show you if I do 40 times 15 it just gives me 600 that's an integer right what is it? Why does it do this when I put a, a point zero? It thinks this is a real number. OK, so. This is type integer INT. So so let me just say it. So I'll type it in there. INT is for integer. And what do we use uh, for real? Well, you can ask, right, if you do type. It's float. OK, so. A real number, a non-integer real number, is called a float. And uh, 
and it shows a decimal place value whenever it thinks it's a float. And the way to make sure that the computer treats it as a float is to put a decimal place in even if it doesn't need it, even if it's not 15.5, okay? Um, so we have integer and we have floats. Okay, and then the one thing we wanna talk about are these functions and these are the ones we said that, that Python knows without any help. Max, min, and absolute value. So the maximum of all these numbers is 54, the 27 times two. And the minimum of all the numbers is 15. The absolute value of negative five is positive five. The absolute value of one minus three is positive two. The answer is negative two, but the absolute value makes it a positive two, okay? And these are all ones that that Python has. I'll also throw this in. You don't have to do this, um, but Python also knows some, although, sorry, it probably wanted some other things. I'll go back and make it the min that it was. Okay. Um, so it knows max, min, abs, and sum. And so now we're going to say the day temperature is 52 degrees, the night temperature is 47 degrees. And then what's the difference? Okay, so the change in temperature for the day is five degrees. You just do night temp minus day temp and take the absolute value. And you could switch those. You could do day temp minus night temp. It doesn't matter because you're going to take absolute value. Again, using the min round. So round works and it will round to the ones place if you don't put a number in, but you can tell it, hey, I want you to round to two decimal places. And by the way, you can get help, and I'll let you read through all of that. It does provide help on any of the functions. Here, this is how we do fractions uh, and mixed numbers. So this is 3 and 10 elevenths, but to get the value into Python, we have to make it 3 plus 10 elevenths. Um, and this saves us doing some, you know, multiplying and kind of turning a mixed number into a decimal by hand. Uh, one third, I can just make a fraction, a, a simple fraction. And and round, you can do this in digits um, and specify the number of decimal places. You can also use this, uh, you know, the comma and just tell it how many decimal places. So So that's just a quick review. Again, I'm pretty sure that this is working how you're expected to. If you've used a graphing calculator, yeah, a lot of this stuff is is very similar. Okay, so let's talk about tables. And I, I, I already talked about this, and I took a picture of this, actually, and put it in the notes, right? So we have a variable called flavor. So the, the names of these columns are the variable. And we have another variable for each um, ice cream dish. So each ice cream dish that's listed, you know, this is the first ice cream dish, this is the second. So each row is an ice cream dish, and each ice cream dish has three different variables. You know, it's flavor, it's color, and it's price. Okay, so what are we doing next? Well, I'm getting rid of the ink so I can scroll up and show you. So sometimes the table is really, really long. So we use this show and then the number and what does it do? Well, it just shows that number of rows. So it's going to shorten the table. Um, now, notice that it says how many rows are admitted. So it's still got these three rows. The data is still there. I haven't changed the data. All I've done is changed how much of the table that I'm displaying. Okay. Get rid of some ink and scroll up. So that's dot show. Um, and the cones dot show with empty parentheses, what does this do? This shows the whole table, okay? So dot show parentheses four will show four rows, dot show parentheses empty with the empty parentheses will show every single row it has. Now you wanna be careful with that. We have one data set that we work with in this class that has all of the farmer's markets in the United States listed. Well, there's over 8,500 of them. Well, that's a really long table. And if you do show all, I mean, it can take a while to show them all. And then there's scroll bars over here on the side and there's all kinds of data. So it, it's just too much data really to deal with on screen. Um, 
So be careful with the show all. <laughs> um, and uh, and make sure you know you check how many rows are omitted before you you tell the computer you want to see them all. Just a hint, helpful hint. All right. So cones dot select flavor. Okay, what does that do? Interesting. So it takes the table and it changes it, or excuse me, it changes the display and it doesn't display anything except for the column you name. And notice that you put it in quotes. Okay, so I put flavor in quotes and that's what it'll show. All right, that's good. So dot select, dot select is for um, columns, right? Cone select, and if I separate two column names with a, with a comma, it'll show both columns. By the way, it'll show whichever one I list first. So if I list flavor and then price, let me type this comma price and get rid of that comma because it'll freak out. Okay, boom. So it will, it's going to put the rows in whatever order I state up here. Okay, and I'm just going to go back and um, you can do edit undo. Um, but it's also control Z, you can see that. And so I'm just here hitting control Z. Why? Because I want to go back to the way it is in your notebook. And again, if you, if you type in price comma flavor, then that's how it's going to display those two columns. And they do the same thing and you can see they flip it. It doesn't matter whether you use single quotes or double co quotes. And notice this hasn't changed the data. Dot select hasn't changed the data. It's only displayed, it's only um, changed which of these three columns gets displayed. Okay, all the data is still there, but again, sometimes because of how much data there is, it's easier to get rid of some columns and just look at the columns that we care about. Okay. Um, cones drop color. Okay. Drop works exactly the opposite as as select. Select produces only the columns that you specify. Drop takes out any column that you specify. So we say drop color. It's going to get rid of this middle column for us. Let's hit run and see that. Boom. Okay. And just flavor and price are left. Again, they're making the point that this doesn't change the stuff that's in the data. So I can still analyze all the data but I only have to display the data that's helpful to me at the moment, okay? But here, cones without price, we're making a new table. So we're using an equal sign and it's assigned to the old table, which is cones, but with price dropped. And then the new table, cones without price, is in fact the new table, okay? So this one is different, but notice the cones table is still the same old cones table that we want. Okay, now this is an interesting one that we're gonna talk about this dot where. So a lot of times we wanna search for items in the data table, okay? And we use dot where to do that, but I wanna talk to you about predicates, okay? So what is a predicate? Well, the predicates are the different um, qualifiers that we use. Um, and so here, we, this is the normal way. We'll see, hey, go into the city column and find rows that have New York City. Okay, that makes sense. What does this say? It says, well, where, go into the rows uh, and look in the city column and any row that has a value that's contained in New York City, Los Angeles. What are we doing? Well, we're going to get two different cities right we're gonna get all the skyscrapers this we're actually using this on the skyscrapers data so we're gonna get all the skyscrapers that are listed that have new york city listed as the city that they're located in and we're also going to get all of the ones that are in los angeles that have that as their city so this r dot contained in we can specify text and again if we put new orleans in here and cincinnati you know we could put multiple names and any time that it finds that text um, inside the, uh, what you have specified inside the uh, r.contained in, it'll pull it out. Um, the other one we're using, uh, the date completed. 
Okay, and we have a predicate called r dot between. <laughs> and it does exactly what you think. It gets the stuff that's between 1970 and 1980, where in the column, in the completed column. Okay, so it's only going to grab rows where the skyscraper was completed between 1970 and 1980. Here, where the height column are above 300. So these are only going to get the tallest skyscrapers. And I believe that 300 is meters. So basically, we're getting skyscrapers that are almost 1,000 feet tall or taller. And so these r dot above, r dot between, those are what we're calling, or what I'm calling, predicates. All right. Okay, so we do the cones where flavor equals chocolate. So notice what it does. It's going to go, and it's only going to grab the rows. It checks the flavor column to find all the chocolates, and it only produces those rows. And notice that the all the data is there. Even though we did do some work with the table, uh, we still have all the data there. Cones sort price. Okay, so we haven't talked about sort. Let's do that. Sort based on price. Okay, and notice that it's got this extra option, sort descending equals true. So normally it's going to sort 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But if you want it to, to, to sort from largest to smallest, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, you do descending equals true. And the same thing, it's going to sort A, B, C. But if you want it to sort, in to sort in reverse alphabetical order, you can do descending equals true. All right, so let's see how both of those work. So run the cones sort based on price, and you can see they do have the smallest price at the top and the largest prices at the bottom. Okay, and then check out the difference when I do sort descending equals true. Sorry, let me get rid of some stuff here. With descending equals true, notice that it has the higher prices at the top, the lowest price at the bottom. So just exactly what we wanted and what we thought it would do. All right. Um, and again, you are allowed to do help on anything like table.sort. Um, so these methods, you don't put the table name in. We just are going to say, hey, table.sort, give me help, and it will. And you can read through that. There is a lot of stuff and some examples. Okay. Cones.sort based on flavor, the column flavor. All right. So, so just real quickly, let me jump up here. And right. So we're talking about cones. I just want to remind you, right. And so if I do cones.sort flavor, it goes into the flavor column and it sorts based on that. And again, it normally is going to sort from A to Z. Okay, if I want it to sort differently, I can tell it descending equals true. All right, so and I do cones sort flavor, and it does B for bubblegum, C for chocolate, and S for strawberry. So it sorts in alphabetical order. And if I want it to do it differently, I can tell it sort based on flavor, but descending equals true. Okay, so the skyscrapers table. Notice that we always use the table dot read table. Command, this is a file. We put it inside quotes, but this is a file name, skyscrapers.csv. You go to file open. I'll just show you that public material. Wait, sorry. Let me go back. Public material, lectures. And we actually have this skyscrapers data set down here <laughs> somewhere. There we go. Got to get to the S's, right? And this is the file. Okay, so right in here. Sorry. Is skyscrapers.csv. So if the file is in the same folder as as the notebook, right? We just tell it, hey, go grab this file out of the folder and open it up. And what does skyscrapers do? Oh, wow. So name, material, city, height, and date completed. And notice that there's 190 rows omitted. So normally, um, it shows about 10 rows and omits the rest. If you want to show all, you can. Um, again, be careful when it's a long table. 
okay? Um, so if we want to sort based on height and notice that they're doing the show five, also descending equals two. So we're going to sort from tallest to smallest and show the top five. What's this going to do? This is going to show the top five tallest skyscrapers in the data set. And the World Trade Center, Willis Tower, I don't even know what 432 Park Avenue is in, uh, in New York. And then Trump Ho International Hotel and Tower in Chicago and the Empire State Building in New York City. Okay, so those are the top five tallest buildings in this data set. And then this is what we were talking about on the slide, dot where the city column is equal to Los Angeles. Okay, well, this is going to get all the Los Angeles skyscrapers. You can see there's one row omitted, so it turns out that there are 11 Los Angeles skyscrapers. Okay. And then here, we're doing the exact same thing where city is Los Angeles, and they're also just dropping the city. Um, I don't know why they're doing that, but notice that it is, in fact, the same list in the same order, but we have dropped the city. Okay. And I can just go looking for one. Say, hey, where is the Empire State Building? And we can see, oh, yep, there it is. It's 381 meters tall. It was completed in 1931. Um, so now we're using dot where the city is New York. And we're going to sort based on completed and show three. So we're going to show the top three or the bottom three. We're going to show the three that were completed earliest, right? Because we're not doing descending equals true. Descending equals true would show the most recent. Okay, so these are the oldest three skyscrapers. All right, and in the uh, in the box below, we do the exact same thing except set descending equals true. So it's going to show the three newest. And let me get rid of the ink. Okay. Um, oh, it's going to show the ten newest. It didn't do show three. So the ten newest, and notice that they're all in 2010 or later, and they're listed from most recent. Um, or the most recent are listed first, okay? Um, now, this is the one I was saying that it's going to look in the city column, and if it has any of this text, it's going to show up. So if there was a city called York, like there is in England, um, it, would, it would actually get that city. But what you're going to see is we're just coming up with New York city and uh, Los Angeles skyscrapers, okay? And notice we did show all. And notice that we have scroll bars. Why? Because there's a lot, a lot, a lot of them. Okay, so be careful when you're using the show all. And then here we're doing where in the completed column we see a number that is between 1970 and 1980. And notice that it's inclusive. In other words, it includes things that were, uh, it, it includes skyscrapers that were in fact completed in 1970. Does it show ones that were completed in 1980? It does not appear to. Um, we don't know if there is one in 1980 or not, but we know that it doesn't have anything above 1978. Why? Well, the over, there's no, you know, rows omitted, right? It'll put rows omitted underneath the table over here if there are in fact rows omitted. Okay, so so we don't know. All right, now, where the heights are not equal to 300. Okay, well, <laughs> none of the heights are gonna be equal to 300. And notice that this is a huge table because it, there's a lot of, of skyscrapers in here that aren't exactly 300 meters tall. And it does skip right over, you can see from 297 up to 302. Okay, and here is where we're going to find all of the skyscrapers that are more than 300 meters tall. And, and again, you see them all. We did the show all. Okay. And then where city are not contained in. So now anytime they have the words New York, or Los Angeles, it's not going to, um, it's not going to show it. So this, 
And notice, right, New York City. City wasn't in here, just New York was. So it's checking the whole text to see if any of it matches a part of this. All the Los Angeles ones are gone, but the New York City ones are there. So if I wanted to get rid of New York City too, if I typed in city, boom, now it's got rid of the New York City skyscrapers. And you can look at the other ones. All right, so what do we do? We type the name of the table, which is skyscrapers, and we do dot where. And I can do where city, comma, Atlanta. Oh, do you see? It's looking for a variable because I didn't put quotation marks around it. So if I put the quotes around my text, boom. And now we have a table of all the Atlanta skyscrapers. Uh, we have a smaller table that's just narrowed in on just the Atlanta skyscrapers. Okay, so that's a nice introduction to how to use the scientific computing in Python and also how to start working with tables. Have a great day.